Hello, my presentation is titled Discovering Your Identity in Science. Obviously, this title, Discovering Your Identity in Science, does not mean that I am going to tell you how to discover your identity, but I'm going to explain how I discovered my identity in science. And I want to encourage and support others who are on their unique journeys to discovering their own identity. My presentation will be more highlighting my journey itself, and I won't be focusing as much on my scientific content and research. There will be time for questions and answers at the end, but if you have more questions about my research or me, myself, please feel free to contact me at a later time. So I will begin with the obligatory baby picture. <laughs> yeah, here that is, me as a baby. It's funny, I look back over some of the work that I've done in dealing with babies, and then I see myself as a baby. I'm wondering if those things that I recognize in babies that I see them doing, if I also did those things as well when I was a baby, makes me think. This is a picture of us celebrating one of my earliest birthdays with my family. I'm showing this picture to discuss my family, my background. My parents are deaf. My mother was born in Hungary and used, moved to the United States when she was about six years old with her family. My dad is deaf, was born in the United States. My father's parents are hearing, but my father has two deaf brothers. I grew up in a house with my deaf parents and my deaf sister. And then across the street was my parents where my dad grew up. And then next door to their house was my aunt and uncle's house. And then down the block were some other uncles and aunts and cousins that lived on our block. So we came together often for holidays, family gatherings. This picture is one example. And there are three different languages. One is spoken English, one is sign language, and one is spoken Hungarian. So uh, from, my, from an early age, I had a mixture of cultures and languages that I was exposed to. I didn't realize that until later on in my life. I thought it was normal. I thought it was something that everyone experienced. But then I learned that not all people knew sign language and not all people know spoken Hungarian. And you have to learn how to interact with people and communicate with people. Sometimes that requires gestures or going through other people to get your message across. Very interesting. <laughs> so I first wanted to be a clown. That was my first goal in life. <laughs> Not really, I'm being silly. But I did love clowns from an early age and I wanted to show this picture. Uh, I actually have a tattoo of a clown now, uh, but uh, that passion for becoming a clown was actually short-lived. <laughs> so from becoming a clown, I changed my mind and decided I wanted to be Godzilla. I wanted to destroy buildings and houses and just clomp around everywhere. And again, that goal was short-lived as well. <laughs> so instead of becoming a clown or becoming Godzilla, my parents told me that I had to go to school. So I went to school, pre-K and kindergarten. I went with other deaf children. And this picture shows my graduation from, I believe, kindergarten. So 
when I was young, going to school, various classes. Science was not my favorite class. I, I thought it was fun to learn new things. And you can see I'm playing here with a pendulum and I'm fascinated. I was fascinated with that type of thing, but I really wasn't interested in learning more beyond that. I was satisfied with what the teacher taught me in class at that time. The guy next to me in this picture, that boy, is my best friend, Vinny. He actually has done most of my tattoo work. <laughs> I have several tattoos and uh, he's done many of them. Well, I progressed through school and I really didn't find one specific topic that I was passionate about, but I did enjoy academia. I joined the academic bowl. I was on a team. We traveled, being involved in various competitions, and it was uh, trivia questions related to academia that we would answer for these competitions. I already knew that I had a curiosity in general and wanted to learn more, but I hadn't yet discovered what that was that I wanted to learn more about. So that was my team. I'm in the middle of the picture here. You can see. The academic bowl experience was a defining moment in my journey. I realized that I had a thirst and passion for knowledge. So I competed in the academic bowl. We went to different schools um, for that. And then when my senior year, I was trying to decide which college I wanted to go to. I wasn't sure at that time. But my guidance counselor told me that I needed to go to college. I needed to pick one. So I told my parents that I needed to apply for college and they were like, really? Okay. They weren't supportive. They weren't against it. They were fairly neutral to the idea. So when I was looking at RIT to apply and I had to put down a major, I really wanted to pick all the possible majors because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. It was difficult. So I chose business management as my degree. I was accepted to RIT, left home for the very first time. When I got to RIT, I became friends with one guy called Aaron. And he was roommate with another guy who uh, you can see in this picture, Jason. So we often went to Aaron's apartment to hang out and I would see Jason there. We started talking and then started to talk even more. And then we really started talking about school and life and I would, just throw out some observations from my life growing up and how my parents used language and how schools choose to teach deaf children. From our conversations, interestingly enough, Jason was working with Dr. Hauser at the time. So Jason told me that he thought I would enjoy working in Dr. Hauser's lab and doing some work and research related to sign language and sign linguistics. At that time, I had already changed my major from business administration to advertising and public relations. So I was getting closer to finishing that degree and needed an internship. I wanted to work in the DefX lab. So I explained to Peter that I wanted to learn more about research in general, that I was curious. He welcomed me into his lab. 
and he was the first deaf mentor, the first deaf scientist with a PhD that I worked with. And that led me to believe that I could do that too. <laughs> really, growing up, I had never thought about that type of thing because I didn't really have a role model to believe that I could be a scientist or a PhD. So I would be excited to show up to my workspace every morning in the lab. I would read different article publications and then Peter would see me coming down the hall or I would see Jason at work and we would talk more about things that I was reading. And really Peter would give me 30 minutes of his time almost every morning just to have an opportunity to chat. So I was able to grow some of the ideas that I had inside and learn what I wanted to do. Peter could see that I was passionate and he wanted to help me get to my next step, whatever that might be. So he invited me to go to a deaf academics conference in Brazil. Floriano Polis is where we were. And so I was very excited to go to Brazil to, to meet other deaf people who were sharing similar interests as me. This picture you see here is one restaurant that was close to the beach. It's difficult to see behind us, behind me, but uh, that's the, the water. We're at the beach there. At this conference, I met some very key deaf scientists within our field. For example, Carol Padden is one person I met at that conference. So Peter invited me into that field and I began to establish my network and learn more about these researchers that I was meeting and hoping to be working with. At that moment, I knew that I wanted to continue with this type of work. So I told Peter that I wasn't quite ready to go into grad school, but I needed more experience and wanted that. So Peter told me about the University of Illinois and a gentleman there, Matt Dye, who had a lab and needed someone to be able to work and help run his lab. So I actually am from Chicago personally. I, if I went to uh, this University of Illinois and Urbana and Champaign, I could be close to my family. I could do some great lab experience. So I applied and got it. I then moved to the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. It's approximately two hours south of Chicago. And I started working with Matt Dye in his lab there. I believe I was Matt's first full-time staff person there. I helped him run a project related to peripheral vision attention. My first formal poster, you can see in this picture, I presented at Tisler, the Theoretical Issues in Sign Language Research Con Conference. And it was held in West Lafayette, Indiana, the year that I went and presented. So I brought uh, this poster, I did a poster presentation, people came by, had to explain about our research, our project from this poster. And one thing I think is, it was a proud moment for me. I felt like I was finally doing what I wanted to be doing. Matt Dye is full of ideas and was at this time. For the next step, he wanted to add neuroimaging to his work that he had been doing in behavioral studies on perception and attention in deaf individuals. So he began a new project at the University of Illinois using an EROS machine. 
This is an event related optical signal instrument, E-R-O-S. Matt brought me on to learn how to operate the EROS machine for the experiments. And for that specific project, we needed structured scans of the brain. So I received saf safety training on MRIs, learning how to prepare the machine for people to come, how to use the machine itself. And that exposure helped me to start realizing what science meant and why certain technological methods could assist in answering a research question. I grew even more through my position at the University of Illinois with Matt. And at that time, I told Matt that I had decided I was ready for graduate school. So Matt Dye had an interview with a newspaper, uh, specifically about his research project. The newspaper was, and he talked about some of the people who helped him with his project. And so this is a snippet from that newspaper. Take a minute to read it. And just to clarify here, I did not have a degree in English. The article says that I did, but I really just had a degree in advertising and public relations. So for the last two and a half years that I worked with Matt Dye, um, I decided at the end of that to go to Gallaudet. I applied for a master's in linguistics. So after two and a half years, I left Matt Dye's lab to go to Gallaudet. And from there, I started my graduate studies at Gallaudet in the Department of Linguistics. And while I was working on my degree, I saw that there was a brain and language lab, BL2, which was run by Dr. Laura Ann Petito. And I was very interested in that. I really wanted to work with them. Although I was a student in linguistics, I reached out and asked if I would be able to work with Dr. Petito, and she said yes. So I started working in her lab, and I worked with them uh, while they were setting up a new PhD program called Penn, which is a PhD in educational neuroscience. And the Penn program is similar to a cognitive neurosciences degree program with a particular commitment to studying how humans learn. So learning anything, math, language, science, anything, just learning in general. So the discoveries from educational neuroscience were intended to have applications to um, educational programs for parents to understand our research, to um, apply that to better educate children in the school setting and to understand that children, children's brain activity is not represented only by their behavior alone. So the woman in this picture with the white shirt, that's Laura Ann. So it was also around that time closer to the end of my first year in the linguistics program. And around that same time, I was applying for the Penn program. But at that time, I started writing a book chapter with Peter, talking about the advantages of learning sign language. So, and let me back up here a little bit. I did work in Peter's lab, and in the mornings, Peter would come in and have a conversation with me every morning. And often the same theme came up in that conversation, which is that I was specifically interested in spatial working memory. I was very interested in learning how sign language itself 
as a spatial language, how it may impact specific areas of the brain that are responsible for processing things that occur in space. So when Peter was asked to write this book chapter, he asked me to work with him because he knew that my specific interests were in spatial working memory. So I was very excited to work with him and to collaborate to write this book chapter during my first year in the Linguistics Master's program. So this is the name of the book here. The title of it is Deaf Gain. And if you haven't heard of it, I recommend that you look into it. It is a paradigm shifting book. So when a baby is born and doctors find out that they're deaf, Often they tell the parents, we're sorry, but your child has a hearing loss. And in this book, we recommend a different approach. We recommend that doctors tell the parents that they have a number of different options and that their child is deaf. So at the end of my first year in linguistics, I received a letter notifying me that I was accepted to the Penn program. And it was a very hard decision for me because I enjoyed the linguistics program but adding the brain part and the cognitive part, I knew that was what I was more interested in. So I made the very difficult decision to leave the linguistics program and enter the Penn PhD program. So I was part of the first cohort in the Penn program with Dr. Adam Stone, who's in this picture. So we were the first ones in the Penn program. We were very excited to be there. And if you know us, you know that we were known as um, the pilot and co-pilot of the program. We were together almost every day, nine to five. We spent a lot of time together. It was a really great time in our lives. So during the Penn training, we were also required to learn a specific system called FNIRS. That's Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy. So Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy is basically when you measure the brain, in general, there are two different ways that you can do that. The first is by measuring blood flow, which is hemodynamics or you can measure the electrical pulses in the brain. So if you don't know, um, your brain produces electrical activity that can be recorded, and that's a more direct measurement of the brain function, where the other way using hemodynamics is basically you get the electrical activity, but the blood is also circulating in the brain. So you can also measure the blood circulation within the brain. So FNIRS measures the blood flow within the brain. So we received a lot of training on that specific system and how to use that. And at the time, I also wrote a fellowship application, an F31, through the National Institutes of Health, which is a highly competitive grant. I wrote that during my first semester as a PhD student, and I received the grant. So I received funding through the F31. And that was historical for Gallaudet. I was the first person to receive an F31 at Gallaudet. And that was another very important moment in my journey where I really understood and realized that I could do this. I had the potential to do this. And I think before that, I was a bit unsure. But at that moment, I knew that I could do it and that if I ran into barriers, I could overcome them. So receiving a grant really verified that I validated that I could do it. I could be successful. And the man on the right of this picture is Congressman Congressman Mark Takano is on the right of this picture. He's a California congressman. And he was one of the many important people who visited the lab at Gallaudet. And I'm grateful to Laura Ann for giving me the opportunity to meet with so many different people who visited the lab and to give me the opportunity to describe what we were doing in the lab and to work on my people skills and how to explain science in two minutes.
So another important moment in my experience working with the BL2 lab is that Laura Ann wrote a very large grant. And that grant proposed the idea of integrating technology. So the FNIRS system, along with thermal infrared cameras, in addition to eye tracking. So to integrate all three of those technologies in order to measure infants' responses to robots and to avatars, and specifically for um, language input, language stimuli. So through research, we know that it's important for a mother and child, or father too, but for mother and child to connect via eye gaze with infants, so the infants see and they learn information from their parent. And research shows that TV, having a TV with spoken language or sign language is not effective for infants to learn language. But we had the idea of including a robot along with an avatar that would behave like real people that would look back and forth from an infant. And we were curious to see if infants would engage with that avatar in the same way that they might engage with a parent. And by engage here, I mean ready to learn language, acquiring language through this medium. And the reason that I mention this now is because this project really impacted my thinking and made me think more about how to advance technology and how to answer new research questions. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So in my studies at Penn, I successfully defended my dissertation. And my dissertation was on neuroplasticity and spatial working memory for sign language processing. And basically, what I did was I used FNIRS to test three different groups. The first group, so all of them were hearing, all three groups were hearing. The first was native signers. Um, people who had been born and exposed to sign language from birth. The second group was non-native fluent signers um, who had acquired sign language after the critical period for acquiring language. So they learned sign language, but they did become fluent, but they learned it later. And then the third category was new signers, novice sign language users. So I gave sign language tests to control for their fluency um, between these different groups. And then I was curious to see if the age of sign language exposure would impact the brain processing areas that are responsible for processing specifically spatial working memory. So I gave a specific test that tested their spatial working memory that had nothing to do with language specifically. So I gave that test while they were connected to an EEG reader. And I found on a behavioral level, meaning their score for spatial working memory, was comparable. There was no difference between the three groups. However, the native signers who were early exposed to sign language had different brain activation compared to the other two groups. So that's early evidence for neuroplasticity in terms of how sign language and spatial working memory seem to um, interact, that if people are exposed to sign language at an early age, that may impact their spatial working memory at a functional level in the brain. We don't know that there's an effect of that, but we can recognize that there is a difference between the brain function of these two groups. So this is me and Laura Ann right after I finished defending my dissertation. And you may notice that my shirt and tie color matches my presentation slides here too. So if you remember, I mentioned when I worked for the University of Illinois, I was very excited to present my po first poster at TSILR. And I was a PhD, when I was a PhD student nearing the end, I went to a presentation where I worked at TSILR presented in Australia. So I presented my work in Australia at TSILR here. And this was very cool. When I was working on my slides for this, I 
really, I didn't realize how obvious the growth was for me. Um, you know, I went from poster to giving um, a presentation here and presenting about my own work, which was just a very cool moment for me. And Adam, my co-pilot, uh, is the one who took this picture. And funny enough, he tweeted this picture and he said, oh, look, it's cool to see three incidences of me and Geo. So you can see me standing on the stage. And then in the middle, you can see me signing an example of something. And then over on the right, you can see a film of me standing on stage again. So there are three incidences of Geo in this picture. So I graduated from Gallaudet with my PhD. And I got a postdoc fellowship at RIT. So it really feels like full circle for me. I went back to where I had already graduated as an undergraduate. And not only was I returning to RIT, but the person who I returned to work with was Matt Dye. Um, and Matt Dye, of course, was the same person that I had worked with at the University of Illinois. So this is a picture of me in front of Rosica Hall, which is my new home at RIT. And now let me tell you more about what I do in Rosica Hall. So I do a few things. I work with Matt Dye on his R01, which is an award from the National Institutes of Health in collaboration with the University of Colorado. And we call that project DISCO, which is the Deafness Implant Signing Cognitive Outcomes, which spells out DISCO. So for DISCO, we have tested hundreds of deaf college students using behavioral metrics as well as EEGs. Now, EEG is a neuroimaging method that uh, this is the third neuroimaging method that I've used, that I've learned to use. So we've tested hundreds of deaf college students to see how they have deaf college students with different language experiences, with different devices, and we support, and we are investigating the way that those devices um, affect their learning. So we are comparing deaf people who do not use sign language, who have a cochlear implant, compared to people who do use sign language who have a cochlear implant. Some of them learn sign early in life and some of them learn sign later. And then deaf people who sign and who don't sign who don't have cochlear implants. So we're comparing a number of different groups here. And we are looking at the way that those groups uh, brain develops. So right now, this is a five-year grant in total. And we just completed our third year of the grant. I've presented at two different conferences about the work that I've done with DISCO as well. And so now we are starting to work on writing up uh, the progress that we've made so far, and we're excited to see the results of our studies. So that's the R01 project, the DISCO project. And then for me, what I'm working on now and what I'm excited to do in the future, uh, Jason and I of course, Jason, the same person who pulled me in and introduced me to Peter in the first place, Jason and I are now working on writing our first grant together. It's an internal grant at RIT, an SPDI. And you can see the title of the grant there, Exploring the Relationship Between Shadowing Technique and L2 and 2 ASL Learners Mirror Neuron System. And basically, we are curious how shadowing um, whether or not it's successful or an unsuccessful approach for teaching hearing people sign language, specifically in RIT's interpreting program. And we want to measure what happens in their brain uh, when they're shadowing or when they're not shadowing. So it's a very cool collaboration. Uh, Jason is a professor of ASL interpreting, so he's an expert in that field. And then, of course, my expertise is in neuroimaging. And so we are combining and creating this new project, this new way of potentially teaching interpreters. And then the RIT Research Seed Funding Award 
I applied for that. And in my proposal, if you remember in the past, I talked about my experience at Gallaudet with Laura Ann. And Laura Ann is very well known for, for babbling studies. Um, for infants who are exposed to sign language, still babble on their hands um, using sign language with milestones that are very comparable to babbling in spoken languages. She has also found that sign language and specifically phonology in sign language, um, at the rate that phonology appears in infants, is also comparable to the milestones of um, infants using spoken language. So she made those findings before I arrived. And then after I arrived and started working with her, we were working on the avatar and the robots and building some different technologies to see how that impacted infants' language acquisition. So at that point, we were also curious about infants who don't have access to sign language. When parents have a deaf infant and they put them in their crib, what if the crib had a robot or an avatar so that the infant could learn sign language on their own. And we measured that through temperature. So we, turned, we measured their temperature and then turned on the robot avatar to engage with the infant. And of course, it's not a permanent replacement for parents for language acquisition, but it's an additional tool that parents could take advantage of. And for the work I did with Laura Ann, we were studying that robots and avatars. And so I wanted to take it one step further. So there is research that shows that um, when infants are developing in their mother's womb, when an infant is tested, they show sensitivity and preference for their mother's language based on um, their development. So for example, giving an infant a pacifier, if the infant hears their mother speaking their mother's native language, they will suck more on the pacifier and they'll be more engaged compared to if they're hearing other languages. So using neuroimaging or FNIRS, we can see more activation on the left side for language that is their mother's native language. So infants, even at birth, we can see that uh, recognition and activation of language acquisition based on their mother's language. So now we're curious about mothers who use sign language. If once the infant is born, if they are more easily and quickly recognize their mother's sign language communication compared to others. So this is a new idea, it's very advanced, and we're not exactly sure how we want to do that. But we must be innovative and have new suggestions. And of course, uh, it will require baby steps, pun somewhat intended. We plan to test the pregnant mothers and have them sign a variety of things and maybe just movements or gestures, but we'll record them moving. So we want some type of technology that can capture, maybe have it uh, attached to their belly and their wrist possibly, and then see if we can capture the data and analyze it in such a way that we can see a difference in movement. And then we can use this information to build a prototype that like I was talking about in the crib, we could have maybe an experimental um, baby and see if it will respond to various movements. A few days ago, I called Peter and was chatting with him about what I plan to do next and so on and so forth. One question Peter asked me was, what do I want to be known for? So since that conversation, I've been thinking about that question. And this that I just explained is what I want to be known for. I want to discover if babies developing within a signing mother's womb will develop a preference for their signing mother's communication 
I'm sure, hopefully, I hope, over the next few years, I'll be able to answer that question. 